I have a question for you. How would you like to have the opportunity to learn from someone who has gone from zero to generating 30 million pounds a year business within just eight years? How would you like to have the opportunity to get an insight into his mind, his behavior, the way he thinks during the most challenging times in his life and come out extremely successful? Well, that is exactly what this video presentation is all about. This interview is all about. In this candid interview with my friend Steve Clark, we talk about some of the biggest challenges he had in his life and how he overcome them and some of the biggest successes he had in his life and how he achieved them. I've got a feeling you might just love this conversation. Here it is. Okay, hi, hi all. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to this call. Today, I have got a very special guest and I'm extremely excited about this call uh, because I guess uh, uh, it, it happens very rarely that we find people who have kind of been there, done it. We can, we can talk something like that about uh, individuals, but today my guest is really someone who I can uh, say um, about him because he has been there, done it, especially in the area of business. And I think, uh, you know, one of the uh, challenges that there is that some people, whether they're in business or in life, some people make it and some people, I guess, uh, struggle. But I think the unfortunate thing is many people actually don't uh, ever get to achieve the goals that they have. And in my experience, and I'm sure my guests would add some uh, point of views to that, is that the difference is the guidance, um, uh, the support, uh, the knowledge, the expertise that we get and also get the support from people around us uh, in terms of mentorship, coaching and information that makes a massive difference. And as I mentioned, there are, uh, you know, on only very people we find who are actually very, uh, very successful. But it's also rare the people who have been very successful and they actually come and share how they have done the things. And that's why I'm extremely excited to um, introduce my guest today, uh, Steve Clark. Steve, uh, welcome uh, to the call. Thank you very much for taking the uh, time today to talk to us. Steve is away in Spain, but you know, when I asked him, could you please come to the call? He just happily agreed. He's, he's got a number of calls going today, but, but he, has, he has accommodated uh, us here. So thank you so much for your time. I just want to give a very little uh, brief about, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, his, his uh, little bit of background, but I Obviously, he's going to tell us about himself as well. Steve is one of one of the uh, country's leading experts in uh, the grassroots sales and marketing strategies. And he he says he's not a theorist or a guru, but a real doer. He has been number of um, running and owning number of businesses in the U.S. and the U.K. And one of his uh, greatest achievements is that he has grown his business in the U.K. His last business generated more than thirty million pounds. Uh, annual revenue in in eight years that is 30 million with the m and uh, it has uh, it, it 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 became time stop 100 fastest growing <coughs> and profitable um, uh, smes in the country he retired in 45 and, and now uh, he can truly have the freedom of time and choice and as we as we, many of us uh, dream to do so steve uh, welcome welcome to the call thank you very much Thank you. Lovely, lovely to chat with you. And what, what an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, would, would you want to get uh, get into uh, the uh, the conversation straight away? Um, so, uh, tell us a little bit about about your background. How you got started into business, and and what sort of uh, um, sort of got you into this uh, initially? What got me into this mess originally? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's really funny. Abby, you're saying about getting to thirty million in eight years. That that a few years ago it used to sound like a real big deal and then along comes people like Facebook who does a hundred million in seven or eight years it uh, pales into insignificance but so how did I come about it I, I don't have an MBA I don't have a business degree like an awful lot of people that are entrepreneurs I, I used to struggle referring to myself as an entrepreneur but I guess I am one I still struggle to spell it I need a spell checker but uh, <laughs> an entrepreneur because I, I wanted to get up and I uh, prepared to take risks to make stuff happen um, but you mentioned in the intro about having the right company that you keep, how important it is to be around the right people. Well, it, in school days, I kind of hang out with the wrong crowd, I guess, really, um, because I don't know who it was that invented girls, hormones and exams <laughs> and brought them all together at the same time. That was, that was a rough <laughs> trick. Um, because I definitely decided the girls and the party and the fun, that was far more fun than going to sit in exam rooms. And so I left school at 16 with no real qualifications and 
the, the fact was, I, it was because I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. As I can now look back at it um, with a, an adult head on and realise that although it was a fun time for sure, uh, and I wasn't doing drugs, it wasn't anything bad. It was just I was hanging out with the party crowd, not the um, the, the, the proper uh, school crowd that I should have been with, maybe. But being in the wrong crowd meant that at 16 I left school with nothing. Uh, by 18 I found myself as a petrol pump attendant. Now, I had to explain that at university recently where uh, although I didn't go to university, I get to lecture at university now, which is kind of fun. Um, but it, the kids didn't even know what a petrol pump attendant was. But I, I had aspired to the lofty heights of being allowed to pour petrol into people's cars. And at 18, I thought, this can't be right. This isn't what I'm, I'm meant to be doing. <clears throat> and uh, it, it was a, a chance meeting on the forecourt with a guy that gave me a cassette tape that, to listen to because I'd asked about... How did he get the car that he's driving? Why is he wearing a smart suit and tie? He was about my age. And he kindly gave me a cassette to go and play, which when I put him back home was a, my, my first exposure to kind of personal development tapes. And there was a guy on the tape that was explaining that if I wanted to see changes, it was up to me. No one else. It wasn't about my exams or my qualifications. If I wanted to see a change in my fortunes and in my life, it was down to me to make that change. And it, it really rang true with me. So I, I started then going about my kind of personal development, reading all I could, and listening to tapes. And that's how old I am. I was listening to cassette tapes. Again, some people listening to this may even know what a cassette tape is. <laughs> was. Um, but but it, that, that was the start of it, Amber, right there, in that I decided I wanted to be like that guy that drove in on the forecourt. All I knew that was he was in sales. Mm. And so I, so I went off and I put myself to a, a, a vocational guidance center, as it was at the time, that did kind of a psychometric profile that gave me the edge over other people because every time I tried to apply for a job I was being told you're not qualified so I want a sales job I'd apply from the, the thing I saw in the newspaper not qualified so when I went to the uh, it was a very very early days of psychometric profiling where it was all done manually and they produced a great big typed report I'll show you this one day Amber I, I found this uh, probably a year or so ago my dad delivered it to me uh, where it's so bang on the money. I was 18 at the time, but on page about 14 of this report, it says, you're, you're meant to be in sales. And it says, but it says, get this, you could go further. Uh, you should be running your own business, helping people with their business. Fantastic. This is when I was 18. I wish mm. I'd read it properly then. I could have jumped a whole, <laughs> whole series of things. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so, so I, I then was able to take this along to interviews. And the very first interview I went to, uh, they asked for qualifications. I said, well, here they are. And I popped down a, about a 20-page report from a professor in Harley Street that said, this guy needs to be in sales. And it was like nothing else they'd ever seen because everyone had their CV and their O-levels or their GCSEs. I had a report from a professor saying they should hire me. And that was I first realized that if you can dare to do things differently, mm -hmm. I don't mean cheat the system, but do things differently, you'll stand out from the crowd. And I got hired for my first sales job there at 18. And, and it was there that everything started to change because I realized if you get good at sales, that's helping more people solve more problems. They'll buy more from you. Mm. It's not rocket science. Yes. And uh, about nine months later, I was the director of my first company. And so it went on from there. Mm, fantastic. I mean, that, that's, that's really great, isn't it? I mean, obviously, you, uh, it, it, it is not only that you saw that you, you are good at sales, but you started your career that way. You, you brought in something that no one else did. Well, and, uh, you know, it, it, was, it, it was a great thing to do. And, and to that end, you, you know, some people say, are salesmen born or are they made and can anyone be in sales? I, I happen to naturally figure stuff like that out. So, and, and, I'm, not, and I'm not alone. Lots of people are like that. But as being in sales is not the archetypical sales person that some people put in their mind. This is the block where lots of companies will fail with their sales, is they think they have to be like the 1980s photocopier salesman, foot mm. in the door, smarming their way through every appointment, not leave until they get the deal, sign the dotted line, close, always be closing. Mm. Rubbish. That's, <laughs> all, that's all so old hat. People need to know you, like you, and trust you. There's nothing new in that. And so that's, that's all I did. But what I did was to present myself differently. Because mm. here's some maths. This is uh, early in the morning for me, but maths. <laughs> if, if you're one of four people pitching for a piece of work and you've got the same product and they're going to buy from one of you, what are your chances of getting a deal if you're one out of four people? 
as that's a question uh, for Matt. I guess that's uh, twenty five percent, isn't it? Correct. Okay. Yeah, got it. Twenty five percent chance. So if you all turn up looking the same, doing the same thing, someone can only choose on your price and what you've got, and you've got a, a one in four or twenty five percent chance. If you rock up uh, wearing a bright red suit with your hair all spiked up, now th that's a bit of an extreme one, but that's my example of being different. If all the others are in plain blue suits and you rock up in a red one, now what are your odds of standing out and doing a deal? <laughs> I guess that's, that's well, less. You're going less, I think, yeah, because I don't like red suits. No, it, my, my analogy maybe wasn't good. But what you've done is you've now given them a comparison of this red suit or these three blue ones. So these mm. three are all the same. This one's different. You've mm. now got a 50% chance because it's one or the other. Yes, indeed. So you've just doubled your chances by being different. Hmm. Anyone can do it. And if, don't wear red suits. Amber, do not go out to wear <laughs> a red suit. You look ridiculous, my friend. I'm sure I will. I tried. I would never no. do. So, so then, you know, people people look at maybe maybe uh, as as you're talking about it, all, all that we have talked about, some of the great success stories and and things that you have done really well. Also, there are things that you naturally have been doing really well early on. But also, there are people who might be thinking, right, you know, someone uh, very natural, that being successful and all of that. How do we, we do that? How, how do we get started? How do we do that? So, so uh, tell us a little bit about, has it been always uh, a success story all the way along for you? Or you had challenges that you had to overcome? You had uh, failures and things like that that you had to go through just like anyone else? Yeah, you know, often lots of people that, are, uh, that have an entrepreneurial story to tell or talk about, uh, failures that I had along the way and I don't see to say this in any way to try and appear or sound smug not remotely but I, I've racked my brains when people ask me what have my failures been and I think well I, I don't I haven't had any failures I haven't been bankrupt uh, I haven't closed down dozens of companies to get to the one that worked I've had lots of challenges absolutely for sure um, but what you do is if you've got your eye set on the prize and you've got some clearly defined goals you find a way to make things happen. Um, one of the biggest problems you can fall into as a, an entrepreneur or as a, a, a one-man band, a solopreneur, is thinking that you are some sort of superhero and you can do it all. Um, we, we, we're not like, who was Superman? What was his real name? Well, and he wasn't a real name, he wasn't a real person, but he got bitten <laughs> by a spider which gave him superpowers. We seem yeah. to think we've got superhero powers as individuals running a business. We think we can do everything. Um, and that was one of the things that I found early on was that I couldn't be doing it all. And that's when I started to fail or stumble or fall, thinking I could do everything. Um, and one of my big, big learnings very early on was to hire people better than me. It's a scary process, um, but hire people better than you. And you get resilient. You find ways to make things happen. I had a business in America uh, in the ski industry. Um, I'd had a, a UK company before that which was going really well but an opportunity presented itself for me to maybe go and work in the States in a whole new business in winter sports and without doing any real research or checking anything out at all I jumped at the opportunity and literally four weeks from being on a ski holiday in Steamboat Springs in Colorado I passed off my shares in the UK company and moved lock stock and barrel to America with a wife, a young baby, and one on the way. So there were lots of reasons I maybe shouldn't have gone and done it, but it was an opportunity. I, I can't live with the thought of, I wonder what it had been like if. So if an opportunity presents itself, I need to see if it works for me now and would it get me to where I want to be. Business in the UK in the late 80s wasn't fun with the recession biting and things, so I, I grasped a new opportunity set up in the States, but it was tough. Um, two nations divided by a common language, they say, and it's mm. so true, although it's a wonderful place to do business, and being in the ski industry was great fun too. Um, but it came with challenges, and we were 18 months without any income at all, mm. and we were really struggling. I was trying to get a deal done to get some investment in the business, and it meant traveling to Italy, to France, to the UK, and back to America to do the deal. And when we arrived back in America, penniless, to go to the investors and say, it's all done, they said to me, that's great, but the investment family, uh, they're a Middle Eastern family that were going to invest in the business, they've now gone back to London before they go to the Middle East for four months. So if you want to do the deal, you need to go back to London, where I've just come from, right. and they'll do the deal. And I didn't have a penny, Amber, nothing. We had 
everything was hot, had no income for 18 months, hadn't paid my rent on the apartment we were living in for nearly four months, uh, and we'd been served an eviction notice, and here I am, I have to go back to London with a lawyer, who I can't afford to pay either, to do the deal. Now at that point, that's where people would see it as a failure, they'd throw in the towel, it, instead I got a bit more resilient. And mm. so uh, what I decided was I needed airline tickets, and I needed them now, we were getting lots of coverage in the media with our product that we were using. And so I made a phone call through a connection that I'd made um, in a hot tub in a health club in Colorado. <laughs> there's, no, there's no bad story to that. It's just how connections <laughs> kind of work. Uh, and I, I made a phone call to a lady who was the head of um, promotions for Continental Airlines and said, Pat, I'd like to come talk to you about us doing some work together. Can you see me this afternoon? She agreed. She loved the English accent. And I went and talked to her and said, what we want to do is you can be our principal sponsor for next season. We'll put badges on our jacket. I showed her the pictures of some of the media coverage we'd had and where we'd been on TV and uh, how we were working with one of the Olympic skiers, all sorts of good stuff. And she said, well, I'd love to, Steve, but we don't have any budget for next year. I said, that's fine, Pat. I'll trade you for airline tickets. I need six international and a dozen uh, mainland US tickets a year. And for that, you can be my headline sponsor. I said, well, that sounds attractive. Can I come back to you next week? Of course, I said, no. <laughs> I need a decision. For that sort of deal, Pat, I need a decision now. Right she now. signed off and gave me the vouchers for free tickets. Wow. And the next day, we flew back on free tickets from Continental without my lawyer knowing into London and put a million and a half dollars in the bank, which was our first round of investment. Mm. So it could have been an easy failure, but instead you try and find ways around it. I think that happens most times. Mm. Yeah. yeah that, that company in the end, where I failed is I, I hired better than me. Uh, I got the chief executive or rather the president from Rollerblade to leave Rollerblade and come and be our chief exec, uh, which gave us a really good headline story for the business um, because he'd built a $150 million company, let alone the industry of rollerblading, and now he was coming to my company to do that for winter sports. Mm. So it was a great story. We took that to Wall Street, and we, we floated the company on the stock exchange three years later. Wow. So, wow, you say. The problem with that was what I didn't get was good legal advice, so I failed. Mm. Okay. Because it meant, that, it meant as an Englishman, I couldn't work in America in the company that I set up. Right. So I wasn't qualified to work in my own company. Back we go to no qualifications again. <laughs> So, so uh, having built it up, I came away with nothing but experience. So I didn't make my millions on that. It was uh, right. a lot of other people did through the flotation, but I couldn't trade mm. my stock on it. Okay, well, well, that's that's very exciting. I mean, I wish we had a lot, lot of time to we need to go to the next section. But the very interesting thing you you mentioned about you know just just going ahead, finding a new way to do that and things like that. And I guess um, I just have this question to ask. You know what 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 sort of was your what, maybe it is too 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 uh, uh, far ahead in time now. Maybe it's too back in time you know, for you to go go back and think. But what was kind of motivation to kind of get you going? Because what you said in this situation you had there is no no money, but still you had to go and make a deal and get things done what what was the motivation what what got you going in those situations <laughs> i was skint <laughs> I'd, I'd put everything i had i'd sold my house uh, got rid of my other business uh, wife and two kids and uh i i, I took all the risk and this is what what defines an entrepreneur versus a business person in my mind is an entrepreneur will take sometimes more calculated than others but a, a, they'll take a risk for financial reward and gain and i don't mean just by gambling i mean i knew that the product deserved to succeed i i know it needed to have and see the light of day and it wasn't happening before so I just had to find a way. And so it's that drive and determination that will keep you awake at night sometimes and will not let you rest sometimes because oh, it sounds corny, but failure is not an option. And even when other things would, people would see certain elements as failing, I saw it as a learning experience and as a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I take from it and try and not repeat the same mistakes over and again. But I, I, you know, I learned hiring a good person like John was amazing. At first, I couldn't understand <clears throat> his management style was crazy. You know, I'd go to him and ask him, John, 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 quick, what should we do? And I don't know if, do, if you've ever seen the film um, Dances with Wolves. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah. There's a wise chief in there. And all he ever used to say, when people go to the chief and say, what do we do? I don't know. He would sit down, look at them in the eye and say, I don't know, my son. What do you think? <laughs> and John would do the same thing. He was this, this 
the head of Rollerblade, who I thought was a genius coming into our company, said, John, what the heck do we do with this? Uh, I don't know, Steve, what do you think? I thought, well, that's all he ever says. But it was genius. It makes you think for yourself. He's not micromanaging. So there were loads of learnings. Um, but what, what drives is, is, like I said at the very beginning, when the opportunity presented itself to go to America and set up that business, I couldn't stand the idea of 10 years on flicking on the news and seeing those skates coming down the hill somewhere and someone else having decided you know, they've, they've taken the product and run with it. And the amount of people that stopped me on the hill during demo days or when we were out with the film crew and they said, hey, what are you doing? I've dreamt of that. I thought of that. I, I, I wanted to do that. Mm. And a little voice inside me would say, well, why didn't you then? Mm. And, and that's, that's maybe the difference. You know, you take risks and sometimes you get the rewards, sometimes you get the knocks, but you have to learn to dust yourself off and get back up. Mm. Great, great stuff. Well, now we uh, may get into um, uh, you know the the, the, the uh, business we have been talking about, and and that generated thirty million pounds a year. Uh, tell us, tell us a little, little bit about that. Uh, then you obviously came back to UK from US, and then is this the business you started? Or there are a few other experiences before that, and then you got to your last business after that you retired. Okay, so this was uh, I, I was knocking around in the US. Uh, knowing that my time was was pretty much up because my immigration process wasn't working, uh, I didn't have qualifications. There were there really wasn't a way for me to stay and work in that business. And we looked at it and thought, you know, we've had eight brilliant years, some great experiences. Maybe it's time now to take the kids home and show them England and get back to the UK. And at that, you know, within days, uh, a really good friend of mine, I, I gave him his very first job when he was 17. He then came and worked with me out in America and ran one of my demo teams for me. And uh, he called me you know, around about that same time when his thought process was going on and saying, you know, he's, he's running a nice little business back home. If I, if I want to come back, you know, I'll come be the sales director with him and we can see what we can do with this business. And it was, it wasn't a very attractive company, if I'm honest. It was kind of a, a breaker's yard for computers. So they were, they were buying laptops particularly, stripping them down to components and selling them back to the trade. But it was a good business. They would test the various components, sell them on, and they were doing just, just shy of a million a year. It was a nice little company, but it really wasn't going. It was a cash cow, but it wasn't going in particular. And I thought, okay, time is right. At least I can go back. I had no money to my name at all. We were back to being absolutely skint. So we, we went, came back to the UK, to, and I agreed to go and work with this guy in, the, in that company. And uh, we rented a house. We had no furniture. And this now, now I think about it, I have got all the sob stories that entrepreneurs drag out. <laughs> I, I forget some of this stuff. Uh, we were living in a, a little rented house on the edge of Hatfield Forest, very nice, nice little villagey place. But we had no furniture. We were sleeping on a blow up mattress on the floor. Uh, kids were doing the same in another room. All our furniture that we had, which wasn't a lot, was in a container coming back from America. Mm. So for a month, we were sleeping on the floor uh, and uh, wearing the clothes that we'd kind of come back in with suitcases and getting them washed and ironed and ready. So, yeah, we were on the floor doing stuff. And I, and I took that job. And I remember as we were, I was going into work each day, uh, I had a nice Saab convertible he'd provided me with and a mobile phone. I felt like it was all great. <laughs> uh, and we were busy building this business. And as I was driving in one morning, I drove past a... Uh, a small kind of Ford dealership and they had various second-hand cars on the forecourt and every time I came up to this corner stopped at the junction looked at the cars I'd look at myself in this Saab convertible and think I'm a fake I'm a fraud you know people on the outside think he had this big company in America he's now back with his Saab and they're all thinking it must be fantastic I'm sleeping on the floor in a rented house on a blow-up mattress and as I looked at these cars on the forecourt I couldn't afford to buy any one of them and it was like, wow, this, is, this isn't how it's meant to be. And so it was kind of like a moment like that that made me again think, okay, you've got to, got to get your head around this and make, it, make something work. And we found an opportunity then at work one day, not too long after that particular moment, when a guy came in and asked, could you fix my computer? Because I, I dropped it, it smashed, but I know you have older parts and things. Uh, I want to get an insurance claim, but the insurance company have told me it's, beyond economical repair and PC world say a new one will cost me 1200 pounds but I really want this one back because it's got all my stuff on I know how it works can you fix it and we looked at it and thought okay yeah we can put a power pack in and a new screen bingo it's all done 
Mm. And I thought, well, hold on. If the insurance company could pay £1,200 for a new one, what would they pay if we could repair it? Because that's just cost me maybe £200 in parts. So between 200 and 1200 there's a thing called margin. <laughs> yes. so, so with his permission, I called the insurance company and said, could you, can you help me? Mr. So-and-so has brought the computer in. Uh, is his insurance policy to repair or replace the equipment? And they said, yes. Otherwise, that didn't really help me much. So I had a conversation. What do you mean? Because PC World say £1,200. And they said, well, if you can supply one and he's happy for less than £1,200, we'd be happy. Okay. What if I could repair it and the customer was happy, but the repair only cost me £800? And it was quiet on the phone. They said, well, we'd be delighted because you've just saved us the difference between 800 and the 12 they were going to pay. So we've saved them 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. And then I said, which was a big bold move, how would you feel if you knew that I made more profit by repairing than I did replacing it? And there was a deathly silence when I realized that insurance companies like to make a profit, not their suppliers. <laughs> and, they, and they said, but that would be great because now we've got a win, win, win scenario because mm. the customer gets back what they want you're motivated to drive the price down to a repair which saves us money and you make more money by doing that. Mm. So yes, that would be fantastic. And that was the very first claim that we really handled for an insurance company. We then put some polish on that proposition and took it out to the insurance companies. And what we found was the timing, as a lot of things, the timing was just right. Um, so I went to an insurance company, rather than getting an order for one more computer and trying to compete against PC World and think, you know, our margin gets squeezed because we can't compete with those guys. Mm. Instead, we were doing things differently again, Amber. That's the key. So we, we became a claims handling company for insurance companies. So if you drop your laptop, you call Churchill, they call us, we handle the claim. And so we started to see step growth where we went from a million to two very quickly, two to four. And we were doing this almost doubling of the business because we would go to another insurance company and offer them our outsource proposition with our call center in Harlow. And this is how we'll handle a claim. We'll bring your machines in. Um, oh, get this. There was a, a new thing called the Weed Directive, the Waste Electrical and Something Directive of Europe. Uh, that's why I love the Euro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which meant that if we get your old computer out of circulation, it needs to be disposed of in a, in a good way for the environment, not just chucked in a skip. Mm. So I had a business that was dealing with spare parts to the trade, and I used to have to buy all those parts in. Mm. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Now my parts have become free because the insurance company asked me to collect it, which I do. If I can't repair it, I ship the guy a new one and mm. charge the insurance company, and now I've got the old one, which I can break down and responsibly get rid of. Not the hard drive, that would be irresponsible, but all the other parts become mine and become free. So now the other part of a business that was still supplying parts to trade, <laughs> our stock was free. It was, it, was, it was a great model. Genius. It was, it was a great model. Um, but it, it worked so well and everybody was happy. And so we saw step growth. Hmm. That then let us go and buy our biggest competitor, which gave us another big jump. And we, we went through an acquisition. Um, prior to that, we applied the let's hire better than us uh, scenario again and we brought in a new chief executive um, who'd been running a massive company um, 40,000 staff but he was the chief exec on a big salary he didn't own any equity in the business and that's mm. a real key for anyone trying to grow their business you can hire amazing talent that you wouldn't think would come to, to you as a small company but if they can see promise and an exit with a big paycheck you'll get really good people in mm. And so we got Dr. Makoski came and joined us and uh, took the pressure off us work-wise and helped us grow the business. Wow, fantastic. And that, that's what we, so, we, so we got that one. But again, an important point, Amber, was back in around about 2000, I set my goal to retire at 45. And if you come back to that four-court garage when I used to drive past each of the cars and thought that you know I can't afford to buy a single one of them, my goal was I want to be, be able to buy the garage. Not one car, I'll buy the whole garage and the business. And that would take quite a bit of money, right? So mm. I was kind of set on that and the retirement idea. I didn't know how I was going to do it because at 2000, unfortunately, I got a, a divorce. Uh, I'd lost my house. I was back to, again, square one, half a million mortgage on the business, 100% mortgage on a two-bedroom house, um, and no idea how it was going to happen. But we set our sights, and that business grew and grew and grew and grew. 
until we we had a, a proper exit. Mm. Wow, excellent. That's great. So, so now, uh, I guess, after all of that, and you, you set your goal, 45 retire, you did that. So that's great. Very people, very people can say, set those sort of goals that, you know, I want to retire and they do. Uh, and I guess sales, I guess, has played a key role in, in your success. And today you are a sales mentor. You, you speak around the world, teach people how to, you know, um, achieve their success in businesses. So let's, let's get into that, uh, that key topic that you, that you teach about um, is, is, is this area of sales. So uh, tell us a little bit about where, where we see things, maybe in the UK and internationally, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess one of the key things in, to, to grow any business to be able to sell. And, and, and you may have seen, and what I have also noticed is that uh, not all entrepreneurs or business owners are really good salesperson, or not also they are willing to learn or go and do that. Is there is some sort of um, lack of, uh, I guess, skills in that. What's, what's your sort of thoughts on that? Okay, um, a, n a number of things. I mean, the, the first thing is that um, if you haven't got sales, you haven't got a business. If, if you've not got a focus on sales, you've very likely got a hobby, and that hobby could be a very expensive one and a very draining one. And what started off as being fantastic because you're passionate about what you're doing will soon become a real headache, a troublesome, troublesome child, uh, and it will be one that will keep you awake at night and it will not be fun. Mm. Um, the, the fact is, whatever business you're in, you're in sales. And, it, and if people don't get their head around that, their, their business is destined to fail. I'm sorry, but that's pretty much the harsh reality. Mm. Um, what I've seen change, and, and I, I consider myself very fortunate. Yes, I did do the retirement at 45. The thing I didn't do was set my goal clearly. Um, because at retirement at 45, I did achieve literally the day before I was 46, we sold the business. So I retired at 45, just squeaking in. Mm -hmm. But um, retirement for me, I hadn't figured what retirement would look like. Uh, and what I found was with no job to go to and nothing to do, I'd be finding my friends saying, do you fancy a game of golf? And they'd say, oh, sod off, Clarky, we've got work to do. You know, it's that, <laughs> I, I, so I was playing golf with 70-year-old men, which was not my idea of retiring at full. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of years out. It was lovely. I'm, I'm remarried. Got a beautiful wife. It's our tenth anniversary in two days' time, um, and you meant to say congratulations. Congratulations! Yes, Thank you very much. I was just <laughs> waiting for you to finish your sentence. I don't want to interrupt you, but definitely would say excellent. Just in case you listen. To <laughs> um, but we we're uh, we're now you know we, we we set goals. I set my goal to retire, and people can if they set the goal and set it clearly, it'll happen. Um, Let's come back. And so now I am retired. This is me being retired. Uh, I'm at my house in Spain working, um, but uh, I'm able to pick and choose who I work with, the hours I work. And it sounds a bit uh, dreamy, but it can happen to everyone and anyone if you want to work sensibly. But from a sales perspective, here's what I see that's changed. This year so far, this retired man has traveled on business to Australia, New Zealand, Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, Portugal, Poland, India, China, you know, it's fabulous uh, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm going to speak to audiences and what I find, whichever country I go to and whatever industry I'm talking to, the challenge is the same. How do we get more clients to buy more often and make more profit? It's the same around the world. The economies may be slightly different, the products are different, but the challenge is the same. And what people need to recognize is the world has changed. In case we hadn't realized, here we are. You know, who'd have imagined a few years back as being able to conduct an interview from the UK to Spain to share this with an audience via a free platform called Skype? Mm. Who'd have thought when someone said Google it, you think, do what? <laughs> what? It, it's changed so dramatically. Mm. So what people need to realize is every company that I know has three sales teams now. You've got a traditional sales team, you've got a, a reluctant sales team, and you've got a referral sales team. So the regular sales team are the people that you expect to go out and meet with people and make the sales. That may be an online shop. It may be people face-to-face -face business. Your reluctant team are the people who work within your office or as I have, I have a team of virtual assistants. I employ nobody now, but I've got several virtual assistants. They're on my sales team. They may be reluctant salespeople, but if they remotely touch a customer or a client, they're in sales. And so it's important that everyone pays attention to make sure that they understand what customer service really means. You need to empower people 
employees or virtual employees, empower them to be able to make the right decisions on behalf of your company for your customers and clients. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And then you have your, your third section, the referral team, which is very much what happens through social media, testimonials, all these other things. It's what other people say that's vital for you and your business. It is pointless to buy an advert in a magazine and hope people will turn that page, see it, and phone you. Those days are so long gone. Mm. So the referral side works. And in fact, I've been practicing the referral thing from day one. If you think back to when I got my first sales job, I didn't go in with how good I said I was. I had a doctor from Harley Street produce a report to say how good I was. That was mm. a third-party referral. Mm. When I got my tickets that, that I got from Continental Airlines, it wasn't me saying this is how good we are. I opened the pages and showed all the media coverage and used other testimonials to win that particular deal. So working on testimonials and recommendations are vital. People need to have video testimonials. They need to have written testimonials, not war and peace case studies, bite sizes that says how good you are because mm. people want to hear from other people and then they'll decide if they know you, like you or buy from you. So sales in my mind has become an awful lot easier than it ever used to be mm. because you've got different areas you can leverage far more and everybody needs to focus on their sales and marketing. Mm. Okay, you know, uh, many business owners and entrepreneurs think they're not really good at scale, uh, in, in sales. Um, is there any key sort of ways that they can improve their sales ability? You know, you, you mentioned about you know having the testimonials, and referrals, and all of that. But there are a few key things that you teach that people can actually follow in order to improve their sales skills and techniques. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I uh, I offer uh, various courses. I offer tim tips and hints that people can go to my website and sign up and get free regular hints and tips and if they apply them guess what <laughs> things happen mm. uh, in simple terms uh, Amber, you know to sell more sell less that sounds a little counterintuitive but to sell more sell less and by that i mean don't become some alter ego don't try and step into a sales suit and be the slick salesman and abc have you heard that always be closing rubbish mm. <laughs> try abl Mm. Always be listening. If you'll listen to what people are saying, they'll give you all the clues that you need to be able to solve a problem for them. And then it's the question of, if you present things to them in a way that they understand and a way that they like, would you allow people to buy from you rather than you sell to them? And if you'll allow people to buy from you, you're in sales. Mm. If you won't, you're out of business. Mm. Or a charity. <laughs> also, heard this interesting concept that you don't actually close, but you actually start or open a relationship when you yes. when you make that transaction, and and that's very interesting. What you what you just said. Well, when I when I spoke in China just now, it was the the year of the horse, and that's all about prosperity and all the good things. Um, but in in China and in Mandarin, they have a term for for this. And it's called guan qi, and guan qi is uh, about building relationships, and so. It, to do business in China, you need to first build a relationship. You need to get to know the person, which is why they want to take you out, make you do karaoke and drink sake or whatever they're, they're drinking. <laughs> uh, but because they want to get to know the person. Well, do you know what Guan Qi applies to us? That's what social media is all about. Hmm. It's not called social selling. It's called social networking. Get hmm. to know me, like me, trust me, then you'll buy. Guan Qi in China, and it's what we should be doing here, building relationships do you know what ROI is in business? Return, return, on, investment. return on investment. Okay. Yeah. Do you know what ROE is? I know that <laughs> because I've been to one of your uh, uh, presentations before. Energy, right? I right? see. <laughs> return on energy, or so that's a good one. Return on energy or return on engagement. engagement For me yeah. nowadays, it's all about engaging with people mm. in as many ways that you can, where they want to engage with you. So if you like, if you don't like social media it doesn't matter get over yourself mm. if your customers want to engage with you on Facebook you need to be there if your customers like reading tweets you better be on Twitter even if you don't like it you can outsource all of those things if you need to but delegate don't abdicate mm. so yeah there's lots of things like that I can share but the, the simple thing uh, really Amber is don't try and be a salesperson be yourself mm. because then you'll attract people that like you and they'll be fun to work with 
if you try and be a salesman that you don't like, you'll likely attract people that you don't like either, and it'll all fall apart. It's it's pretty simple, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Now you obviously started your sales career a long time ago before the social <coughs> media was there, and now I I know that uh, with the digital uh, you know age, a lot of new technologies and and platforms have come in, but you have embraced them very well. You are on there, you are visible, you you are active, you are doing incredible strategies and all of that. So. I guess you mentioned that's all part of your sales strategy and of all things you may, you may teach also. Uh, tell us a little bit about how sales has changed in maybe the digital age and maybe some of the things that people can do right now using the digital platforms uh, that could help them. Okay. Uh, the, the first thing is don't just jump on Twitter and start tweeting about the fact that you've just had a roast beef sandwich. You know, ping, no one cares. You, you've got to have a strategy. So. Uh, I, I, I spent two weeks of my life going onto Twitter and tweeting about everything I could and thought, this is absolute nonsense. What's, you know, this is crazy. What a waste of time. Bang. And, and then I started to realize again, well, it can't be a waste of time because people better than me are using it and making it work. So I then learned what it takes to make it work and how to apply a strategy. So, and in fact, as a result, uh, I ended up running seminars all over the east, uh, southeast of England for Business Link, as they were at the time. They approached me and asked if I would do it um, because there were lots of social media experts out there, but I was actually making it work for business because I understood the, the subtlety between social networking and social selling. And there is a big difference. People need to know you, like you, and trust you. So it's not about 10% off, buy one, get one free. It's about building rapport. Mm. The, the only thing is with that, Amber, it's just sales 101. Sales, think of the last big purchase that you made. The, the last purchase you bought for the house, if you bought a stereo, you bought a, a new TV, you, the chances are you've got to have a bit of rapport with the guy that's selling it to you. You might have gone online, done the research. But when you go to the shop, if the guy's a complete waste of space, you may not go and buy it. Maybe you do because it was the cheapest in certain commodity areas. But when you think about buying a car, if the guy was just sharp on the, on the sales line, you may not buy. You want to know you trust people and like people, then you buy from them. You do the same thing. R-O-E, return on engagement. That's social media as well. It's, it's too big a topic to do here. I'm happy to do another call with you another day and we'll talk about <laughs> social media because I love it and it's a, it's a really good topic, but it's only one, one quiver in your, whatever we call it, the uh, one arrow in your quiver. It's one, mm. one particular weapon in your arsenal. It's, you don't drop everything else and just go on Facebook and Twitter. You can do lots of things. You need to be in my book. I talk about being a multifaceted marketing machine. Mm. You need to be doing lots of things. So the digital age has come around, but it gives you lots more things to do, not less. Mm. But it sounds like it's too much to do for some people. It becomes overwhelming. It doesn't have to be. Get help. Mm. And I guess once you have a strategy, as well, which is what what I do, as 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 you know, as, as you might know, as part of our business, is put together strategy uh, for our clients on, on digital domain. And I think one of the things that a uh, term that is very kind of relevant today is uh, marketers call this connection economy. So you yeah. need to establish connection today with your target audience. I think we should do. We should do. I can do a call on social media and get some insights from you. Uh, I guess we are kind of approaching um, at the end of end of uh, our, our conversation today. Uh, you know, people who are actually watching might like to uh, know if, how they can get more of you and you know, maybe learn more things from you. So how do they find you and how do they get started with uh, things learning from you? So the first thing that you may be able to edit and pop into here, I don't know, is they've got it. And my, my website is the first place to go to for, for resources, which is Eureka Sales, E-U-R-E-K-A, Eureka Sales, all one word, .co.uk. And on there, you can sign up for my uh, Sales Made Simple tips, which I send out on a regular basis. You can even download a copy of my book that I mentioned, How to Thrive, Not Just Survive. You can download it as an e-book with my compliments. There's no, no charge on that as well. Um, they're, they're good places to start. In terms of what I offer, I have some one-to-one -one clients, but I only ever work with five or six one-to-one -one clients. Uh, and I am kind of like Apple, reassuringly expensive. Uh, but I get results, and I, and I have no room for one-to-one -one clients at the moment anyway, so I'm not selling that. What I am doing is I, I run regular uh, monthly programs called my Platinum Mastermind Group, and the results that people are getting there are phenomenal. Uh, I'm going straight after this call. I've got three more calls back-to-back, -back, which I call chemistry calls, where I'm able to set up for people to call me and have a chat to see whether we have the right chemistry 
to see whether they would fit with the group and whether I would get on with them and, and vice versa because it's an invitation only group that I run but we meet every month it's fantastic it's like having a virtual board of directors all pulling in the same direction working with you so in the mornings uh, I have a, a speaker I've got some great connections in the speaker world I bring in some world-class speakers to run mini masterclasses each month and then we work masterminding and brainstorming on various activities that each of the group have got that they want to do and they'll all go away with action points to to work on that's followed up a couple of weeks later with one of my coaches to make sure that you're implementing it and then two weeks later we're back to a live event again so every month we have a live meeting it's kind of on one of the emails i was terming it my mba because it's about motivation brainstorming and action mm. it might, it's my mba i'm full of acronyms that's my <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, because I think one of the things that has made the biggest difference in my business and my life is, is the mentors I had, people I've, I've worked with. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the people who struggle and don't get the answers, so to speak, I think it's like uh, what I can uh, remember from my, my sort of uh, uh, education, so to speak. When I go to the, uh, the university, they didn't say go and reinvent the theory of uh, the gravitation, for example. Or, or uh, you know, and, and I think that's that's what most people are doing, reinventing the wheel, where there is resources, help, support, where you can go, you can learn the thing, and just follow the steps. And I, it's, it's a lot more easier than, than it looks, but I guess you need to take the action and do, do the things, I guess. It's, it's, exa it's exactly that, because if, if people... Uh, I, I, I do run... Quite often I run a one-day event, but that's... Hey, one day I can motivate and inspire and give people things to do, and then they go away and get busy, which is why... The regular repeat action with my mentoring program really has an impact. I've been running that for over three and a half years now, and I've got people still in, this, in my original group that have been there two and a half years. They wouldn't be coming back paying the amount of money they pay if it wasn't getting them results. But it, it is knowing what to do, knowing that you've got... Remember right back to the conversation, I was in the wrong group of people at school, didn't get the right qualifications. If you're with the same group of like-minded business owners in different industries getting together every month, You've got to be a fool not to be able to take that energy and what you can learn from the group and their support and apply that to your business and start to grow. And that's what we're doing. It's working really well. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Steve, thank you. Thank <coughs> you. Thank you so much um, for your time. Um, any, any final thoughts, parting thoughts before we finish the call? Parting thoughts. Uh, you, you've got them all there. It's about, <laughs> it's about action. It's about making. So have a plan. You must have a written plan, not a, not a 30 page BS plan plan single a4 plan if people want help with that they can email me steve at eurekasales.co.uk email me and i'll send you a link to my a4 down and dirty plan a business business plan needs to be on one single a4 page if you haven't got that you're lost so an a4 page is what you need to do and then what you do is each day you take action on it and the, the biggest thing that will leave you with two things one stop complaining it's nobody's fault but your own if things aren't going right. Stop complaining, take responsibility. Two, find three people a day that you know you should be calling and for whatever reason you haven't called them that could help you move your business forward. It could be a client, it could be a friend, a colleague, a mentor, but each day know that you've got a list of three people that you are going to call that day and then pick up the damn phone and call them. Three people a day. Everyone can manage it. And the results you'll get if you apply that consistently are enormous. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, bye for now, then. You're very welcome. We'll talk again. Cheers. Thanks a lot. We'll do. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.